Okay, uh, this is colourful language, and some of you will know that in English the expression colourful language means abusive and rude language. I want to assure you I'm not about to insult or be rude to you. I hope not. You will also see on this slide uh, the name Simon Hansen. Um, Simon um, is a whiz with computers. I know absolutely nothing about them, so Simon is responsible for the PowerPoint. Um, Simon is also uh, my colleague in light touch colour light therapy, but he was first my guinea pig, um, my first client, if you like, when I had Jan's first light set. When I met Simon, he was in a wheelchair with a whole lot of physical problems because he has multiple sclerosis. Um, four years later, with a lot of light and other things as well, good attitude, um, he plays golf and he has um, very few physical problems. Um, he has also uh, been inspired to take the training himself and he is now a qualified Samasati light therapist. So that's why Simon is there. Now, um, why did I get it into my head to do something on language? Well, there were two incidents. Let's see if this will work. No, that's not what I want. Let's try the other one. You see, I really don't know anything about <laughs> computers. The first thing was um, one of my students, a Chinese student, had successfully completed the bridging course that I was teaching and was able to go to the main campus um, to do his chosen field of study. And he said, I am so happy. Red flowers are blooming in my heart. And I thought, isn't this poetic? This is wonderful. Red flowers blooming in the heart. The second thing, um, if we go back to 2002, there was a terrorist bombing in the island of Indonesia. 200 people um, died and another 200 were seriously injured, maimed. The Indonesian authorities fairly quickly caught the perpetrators and we had six years of trials and appeals and eventually the Bali bombers were executed um, in November last year by firing squad. Within minutes of their execution, the people who supported them said their martyred souls are being taken to heaven by green birds. Now I thought, well, if you don't have a plane or an angel, I guess a bird is a good way to get there. But why green? Now, I don't have an answer to that, although I think it's because green is a very significant color in Islam. Uh, it was said to be the Prophet Muhammad's favorite color. It is also said that when you get to heaven, you will be in green silk garments. Um, but that's, who knows. Um, so having decided that I would talk about color and language, I thought, well, the first thing to do is to get a definition of what color is. And um, as Alexander actually told us yesterday, um, I discovered that color doesn't exist. There is no blue in the sky. There is no green in grass. There is no orange in carrots. Um, it's all in here. The perception of color is what is known as an emergent property. In other words, it doesn't exist by itself, but when other conditions coalesce, come together at the same time, then the perception of color emerges. So it is um, a condition, of, well, it, it emerges from lighting conditions, the reflectance from objects, electromagnetic radiation, cone receptors and our retinas, and brain processing. Um, however, most of us, let's say 99.3% of the people on the planet believe that color exists and so we will continue and talk as if it really does. Now I say 99.7, there's probably 0.3% of the people on the planet who don't have the same color perception. Um, and since we are in Greece, let us use some Greek words to 
talk about these things. First of all, there's synesthesia. Sin meaning together, sthesia, feeling. And these people um, see objects but, and colours, but at the same time, they might smell them. We have uh, two twins that come to our practice, and whenever we put yellow light here on the corpus callosum point, their eyes go down and they go, <sighs> roast pork, again. <laughs> um, it could be that they taste things. And again, there's another color that Simon uses with these girls, and I don't remember which one it is, but they'll say, mm, French fries. You know, they, they can taste that while seeing the color. Um, some people may have a sensation. Other people may hear a particular sound. Now, there was um, a, an Australian concert pianist, Aaron MacDonald, who, sorry, Mick, uh, Macmillan, who died um, a couple of years ago. But Aaron particularly liked playing things in the key of D. And somebody said to him, Aaron, why do you transpose everything into D? And he said, I just love how yellow D is. I feel so happy with that. Um, and uh, so it is. So let's look at some of these other people. Um, some people suffer from or experience, maybe it's not suffering, chromatopsia, chromo, um, color, opsia, seeing. And for these people, the grass may be orange, the sky may be green, and the carrots are blue. Mm -hmm. Then there are other people who a chromatopsia, a not, so they don't see color at all. Now this condition, I don't think, now the doctors here can correct me, but I don't think anyone is born with this. It usually happens from a brain tumor or a blow to the head. And what happens is that these people can no longer perceive color. They can no, not only no longer perceive it, but they have no memory of ever having um, known it. So you can talk about yellow and they go, what's that? I have no idea. Um, the neurologist Oliver Sacks has a particular case in his book, An Anthropologist on Mars, of a prolific painter in Italy who used to do these wonderful, big, colorful canvases. The man had a blow to the head in a car accident, could no longer um, see color. His food became uninteresting. He couldn't find socks that matched. His life's just terrible. Um, in Brian's book, um, there is a kind of a reverse thing of this. Um, there was a um, chiropractor, Dr. Dubin, who was treating a Vietnam veteran who had post-traumatic stress disorder. And this man did do artwork, but it was, it was gray, it was sad. You looked at these pictures and, oof, your gut just went, oh. Uh, Dubin treated this man with 30 sessions of light, after which he was painting lovely, big, colourful canvases again. So I was almost tempted to write to Oliver Sacks and said, have you considered light therapy for your um, patients? And then there's this thing, uh, dyschromatopsia, dichromatopsia, parachromatopsia, dichromatism, daltonism, deuteranopia, or plain old color blindness. Okay, what are we doing next? All right, um, we've got all these words, and if you want to look up a word in another language, not your own, what do you do? Generally, you go to your trusty bilingual dictionary. So I decided to do this. I went to the highly regarded Arabic English dictionary of Dr. J.G. Harvath, and I looked up the word jawn. And jawn means black, white, red, intensely black horse. This was a little confusing, I have to say, that something could be both black and white at the same time. Um, but it turns out that this is actually a literary device, something used in the Quran, where a word means both itself and it means its opposite. 
And this is a way of indicating that Allah is everywhere to everyone at all times. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's timeless. It's all there. So that's, we have another few examples of Aladad. Uh, John, of course, black and white. Sudfa, meaning light and also meaning darkness. Lamaka, which means he wrote it and he erased it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so that, that kind of explains John the black and white to me. Um, still a bit puzzled about the red, and I have absolutely no idea about the intensely black horse, but never mind. Um, black, white, and red, and in that order, are significant for a completely different reason. Because that is the order in which color terms come into languages. Um, so if a language has only two color terms, it will be black and white or light and darkness. If they have three color terms, it will be black, white and red. Now, this is not to say that the people don't perceive all the colors. They simply choose to linguistically categorize them in big chunks rather than small chunks. Now, this came out of some research done in 1967 by the linguist Paul Kay and the anthropologist Brent Berlin. Kay and Berlin um, talked to people from 110 different language groups. Um, these were languages with written traditions and also languages of nomadic peoples who lived in remote valleys or tribes wandering about. And what they did was they got a whole bunch of these little color chips that you get from the paint store when you're trying to work out what color you want to paint your walls. <clears throat> they put all these, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they, they put out these color chips and they said to people, could you just put them into the piles of what you think the colors are? And of course, some people went <laughs> black, white, that's it. And some people made three piles. And the Russians, because they had to be better than anyone else, had 12 piles. <clears throat> But now, in the, in the 42 years um, since Kay and Berlin did their research, there have been a lot of people challenging it because it's not comfortable to think that we are so, so predictable. Um, you know, there have been linguists, there have been anthropologists, there have been information technologists, there have been um, philosophers, there's been um, cognitive psychologists, all trying to prove that. The Berlin and Kay research is flawed, but in fact, there have been no serious challenges. Somebody will say, oh, well, the Himba tribe of Namibia have a have different word for brown, and the um, Barimba tribe of Papua New Guinea have a different term for blue. But in fact, nothing seriously has challenged the Berlin and Kay view of things. So let's have a look. What is the order in which things come in. If you have just uh, two color terms, uh, dark, cool, and light, warm, or the black and white, uh, stage two, red, stage three, either green or yellow, stage four, both green and yellow, stage five, blue, then brown, and then these come in in any old order. Um, so, Let's look at this first, oh, oh yes, that's all right. This first division into black and white or light and darkness, I think, is an appreciation that people have of the diurnal rhythms, that night follows day, follows night, follows day. Um, this perhaps is an expression of opposing principles, du the dualism. You either have two things which complement each other. Thank you, Wilma. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this sensitive person knows when I get nerves. The shaking hands, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so there's either things which um, complement each other, like um, day and night, male and female, yin and yang, or things that oppose each other, good and bad. Um, 
And if you go to the cosmology of just about any peoples on Earth, you will have stories of creation, and Brian um, gave us quite a lot of these yesterday. Um, people seeing light coming from darkness and creation coming out of the darkness into the light. Um, obviously in Genesis, um, we have God moving upon the waters and he said, let there be light, fiat lux, because God, of course, in those days spoke Latin. Uh, um, and uh, he saw the light was good and, he, and thus was the first day. In the Quran, there's a lot of reference to Nur, to light. Um, in the legends of the Polynesian people, and again, um, Brian referred to this with the god Maui yesterday. Um, again, there's gods of the sun and, and gods of light. In um, Egypt, you had Horus, who was the god of daylight. <coughs> um, you had, and, and the daytime and the sun. You had Set, who was the god of night and of darkness. Um, in South America, the uh, god, or the first Inca man, actually, Mango Capac, was brought out of the deep waters of Lake Titicaca by the sun god Inti um, into uh, onto the earth. And you go to the uh, Indians of North America, uh, the, the Navajo, the Ute, the Zuni, they all talk of coming out of the earth into the light through the Kiva. Um, Hindu uh, cosmology has great cycles of 5,000 years of darkness and of light. Um, the darkness being of ignorance and um, having to go through rebirth till you get it right, and um, light of uh, knowledge and um, enlightenment and finally to nirvana. And we have this quote from the Bhagavad Gita, which will eventually, I believe, appear on the screen. No? All right. Okay, there we go. If you eliminate avidna, darkness, how do you know light from darkness? Darkness is a necessary complement of light. Yeah, it is, yeah. All right, let's look at some of these colors. Um, now, we ass assume, or I'm assuming that the black and white, the first division, is um, because of appreciation of diurnal rhythms. Red, I guess, is because people appreciated the warmth of the sun, and maybe there was ripe fruit or things that were good to eat, so red came in. Similarly, with the green and the yellow, vegetation, things you can eat. Let me get to blue, and blue is the area where the most challenges to the uh, K and Berlin um, order has come. Um, now, of course, if, if you only have black, white, red, yellow, and green, what do you do with blue? Where do you categorize it? Well, you stick it in with the greens. Um, so we, and if you do have blue as well as green, where is the division? Where does green stop and blue start? So this will lead to different uh, things in different languages. So the Vietnamese will tell you that the sky is green um, and they're not suffering from chromatopsia. That's the sky is green for them. Um, the Japanese will tell you that traffic lights are blue. And if, uh, if you're not feeling particularly well, um, your skin looks blue, um, not green, as we would say in English. Um, Japanese has an expression, con, which is a very dark blue. And this is kind of interesting. Um, Japanese has a thing, a, a quality called shibusa. Something is shibui. Shibui is a quiet, restrained elegance that nobody who is not Japanese could possibly appreciate. Um, and one of the colors that is in Shibusa is con, this very dark, restrained navy. Um, uh, Turkish has a special um, word for the turquoise that is used uh, only in religious um, decoration. Russian, of course, with their extra group than anyone else, has the sky blue as a distinct color category. 
Japanese, I think, might be a reasonable challenge to the K and Berlin order because linguistically, black, white, red, and blue, but not green and yellow, um, function differently. The way you form the adjective is different, um, the, the noun is actually different, and the adjectives can be conjugated. So you can have aka, akai, it's red, akata, it was red. And, and you can do that with black, with white, with red, and with blue. You have to do the past tense and the formation quite differently with the other colours. So that could be um, that could be a challenge. What about children's language? Um, do, does the acquisition of colour terms follow the order of K in Berlin? If you're Russian, yes. As for other languages, frankly, I don't know. The research is out there. I haven't made the time to actually trawl through it all. Um, one thing we do know, and this is from research done at the University of Surrey by Dr. Anna Franklin and her team, language, uh, sorry, colour perception is lateralised in the right hemisphere for infants, but as soon as they start to learn language, it goes into the left hemisphere, which means that language is imposing categorisation, um, not um, perception itself. Okay, how do colour expressions in, in metaphors and things come into languages? It seems to me that there are three different sources. One of them is biological. We have bodies, bodies react, this can be seen, and we get an expression. Another one is cultural, that a practice starts in one country, one culture, and it is adopted in other countries along with the words. And then there are things that just happen for no apparent reason. Um, let's look at some of the biological ones, or physiological colour. If you are angry, um, your blood pressure goes up, your heart starts beating faster, your eyes open, um, you go red in the face. If you are embarrassed, blood rushes to your face. And this can be seen by someone looking at you. And so a lot of languages have expressions with the red in um, for this phenomenon. In English we say to see red when you're angry. In um, Italian, vedere tutto rosso, see everything red. German, you're going to have to correct me on this, rotzen, yeah, to see red. Um, with embarrassment, um, in English you go red or you turn pink. Japanese, sekimen which means red face, or ak akatsura ga suru, uh, sorry, um, akatsura ga aru, um, to have a red face. French, devenir rouge comme un cerise, to go as red as a cherry. Mm -hmm. Dutch, fur rot, uh, fire red. German, rot werden. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Spanish, <laughs> yes, I am very, yes. Um, <laughs> Ponese rojo in Spanish. Um, and Arabic, uh, amara wajihaho, um, amara his face, wajihaho, turning red. Um, so we have those. Similarly, <clears throat> when you get um, fear um, or cold, blood drains from your face and you do look white or blue. Um, but here's something now, Alexander, I'm sure is going to answer my question on this. <clears throat> A lot of languages have the expression to be blue or to have the blues when you are depressed. We even have an association in Australia called Beyond Blue. And this yeah. is, do you have it in the States also? No, yeah. I love it. Um, it it's, it's to help people who are depressed. But here's where I have my question. With embarrassment or anger or cold, you can see that the person has this colour. But when someone is depressed, you do not see that they're blue. They say, I feel blue. So what is the neurochemical, is it a collocatamine or a peptide or a hormone? I think, I think it's just an expression of sympathy. 
No, I don't think it is. I think there's something more than that. Look, can I just finish my question before we get some answers in on this? <clears throat> um, I think there's something happening at the neurological or neurochemical level that makes them perceive blue. If we go back to the fact that colour does not actually exist, but it, it's an, an interaction of various things, including neurological things. The other thought I had is that um, there is the music, the blues, um, which was um, invented by African Americans who were having a very depressing, very nasty time. And the blues is always in a minor key. Now, people who study uh, the brain tell us, and music, tell us that the blues and minor keys have their effect of invoking sadness, evoking sadness, um, because they lack resolution, that you actually need more energy to push you into a major key and resolve that feeling. So I wonder whether depression is a case of lack of energy. I do know if I stick somebody on my table, they come in, oh, I'm so depressed, on the table, bang, orange light, and they get off the table and they're sort of singing in their way out of the treatment room. Um, so, I don't know, um, why is depression blue? Brian, it's you... the most discharging color, it's an ener energia. And the opposite would be the orange or the, the yeah. red, which is full of life force, but it's so... So we are looking at frequencies, and we are possibly looking at neurotransmitters or something. It's the uh, <coughs> Kellogg, as I talked about, was using red light rooms in the early 1900s yeah. for these catatonically depressed, chronically depressed patients. Yeah. Yeah, I just sort of thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, Okay, cultural transfer. Now, in the days before computers, when people sat there with pens and um, even quill pens <coughs> and wrote things out, your assets were always written in black, your liabilities were written in red, and then along came the auditor and he approved it all in green. And so many languages have expressions like in the black when you have enough money, in the red when you're in debt. And that is a cultural transfer. Um, and then there are expressions that just happen. I mean, we could decide right now this minute that dark green was an expression that something was fantastic. Kia, is this a dark green place? Yes. The cocktail party last night, the birthday. Dark green, dark positively green. dark green. Yeah, the Greek evening tonight, it's going to be dark green. Okay, we could say that, just out of the blue. Okay. <coughs> okay, I'm just going to, yes, I love that. Um, I'm going to need some help with some of these things. Um, we, there are thousands of colour terms, so we certainly don't have time to do them all. I'm just going to do a few. I'll do some about black, which is normally about things that are unpleasant, unwanted or illegal. Um, Phyllis, would you help me with these two in Norwegian? You've got them? Yeah. You, you have the paper? All right. <laughs> I'll give it to you in English. Phyllis did to me, but I haven't learnt how to pronounce them. There's one to look black at something or to be negative. Yeah. And another one to only see black. Yeah. The, the yeah. Oh, yes, yes, this is everything is black, everything is negative. Um, uh, if you are hit by one, that's pretty negative. <laughs> <laughs> there are exceptions, I'm just, just taking a few things here. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, Spanish has um, lo vedero negro, he sees everything black, everything pessimistic. German, uh, estatzea. 
um, someone who sees things in a black way, a pessimist, a Dutch uh, Svartkijker, a black looker, a pessimist, French uh, Breuil du Noir, to mope around to see everything in a dark way. Um, there are the illegal black things, German, the Svartsfahrer, somebody who rides on the subway or the train without paying their, for their ticket. Um, English has the black market, where you buy things illegally. Spanish has uh, dinero, ne sorry, dinero negro, black money that you earn illegally. French has tr uh, travail noir, to work again illegally. Um, and then there's some odd black ones. Um, a French detective novel is a roman noir, a black novel. Um, in Japanese, a huge crowd of people um, looking on um, is uh, Kuroyama no Hito, a black mountain of people. And Dutch has a, a similar expression, Hitsitz wat van de mensen, looks black from the number of people. Um, going to some of the other colors, maybe just one for, for each, some unusual things. Um, Indonesian talks of uh, Banyu Puti, and this is white water, and it's not water that you go rafting on, it's water that is safe to drink. They also talk about the Golangan Puti, these are the white voters, the people who say, huh, we've had the same government for 50 years, my voting doesn't make a blind bit of difference, I'm not even going to bother. So the people who don't bother to vote. Um, Interesting one from Japanese, uh, Akano Tanin, this is a black other person, sorry, a red other person, a complete stranger. I, I don't know why it means that, but it does. Complete other stranger. Um, Russian in fairy tales always talks of uh, beautiful young women as being, I should get this under the light or I should hand it over to um, Elizabeth. Um, Krasnaya Devisa, a red red young woman. Um, yellow, um, Spanish uh, Sindicato Amarillo, or Amarillo if you happen to come from Buenos Aires. Um, a, a, um, a trade union that works with the bosses and against its members. Um, yeah. English, English talks about the yellow press and this is the um, newspapers which only have salacious stories and the gutter press. Um, green. Now, in a lot of languages, if you don't know much about anything, you're very new to things, you're green. Or if you happen to be one of those languages where the green and blue are a little bit mixed up, then you could be blue, meaning you don't know much about anything. Um, in Italian, if you're bankrupt, you are al verde. Uh, yes. And in Spanish, if you've done too much of something, you've eaten too much, or you've drunk too much, or you've worked too much, you've just had enough of it, you, um, danse en verde de algo, you give yourself green of something. Um, okay. Um, and because my Russian is so terrible, I won't give you the, the last one. But in Russian, if you, you say, I don't give a damn, Nothing to do with me, I don't care. The expression is, um, it's all violet to me, the, the deep violet. Okay, let's look at some associations or affiliations. Now, um, we are accustomed to seeing political parties and sporting teams and things um, associated with particular colours. This may well have gone back as far as... Um, the Roman times of the emperors, or the imperial Roman time, um, there were many, many chariot races and ch chariot teams. When it got to the time of the emperor Caligula and the emperor Nero, there were down to four major teams, the Rusata, the Reds, the Albata, the Greens, the, sorry, the Albata, the Whites, the Veneta, the Blues, and the Prasina, Rusata, the Greens. Um, the Emperor Nero was particularly associated with the Greens. He was a passionate supporter of the Greens. He would spend nights down in the stables with the horses and with the charioteers, and we don't even want to know what he got up to. But the thing is, ancient Rome wasn't very democratic. If you didn't like what the government was doing, <clears throat> there was nothing much you could do. You couldn't go to your local senator and complain. 
So the only way that the general populace could show that they really disliked what was going on was to show support for the team that was not the emperors. And so everybody was against the Greens. Um, in um, modern times, of course, if you're looking at um, uh, communist or labor parties, they tend to have red associated, the conservatives are blue, the Greens are green, the Social Democrats are yellow. We've had a lot of political movements associated with particular colors. I'm thinking of Yushchenko's orange movement in the Ukraine a few years ago. Um, actually, just last Friday, there was a big political rally in Tehran against the elections, and everybody was wearing green. This was to support Musabi. We also saw last Friday a huge gathering of red shirts in Thailand. Um, uh, protesting against the government and supporting the ousted Taksan Shinawati. Um, in Indonesia, the Golkar Party, which ran Indonesia for 50 years, is Sikuning, the Yellows. Um, and um, in neighboring Philippines, Corazon Aquino's Yellow Party was the, the gentle revolution that overthrew the Marcos dictatorship. Um, around about this time last year, you may remember that the red shirts who were protesting in Thailand last Friday actually took over the parliament building and they had a sit-in for three months because they wanted to change the government and they did change the government. These were the supporters of Taksan Shinawati. But no sooner had the government been changed than suddenly the streets were full of people wearing yellow t-shirts. And the yellow t-shirt people took over the international airport, they took over the domestic airport, they shut down a conference center in Pattaya where the Association of Southeast Asian Nations conference was being held, shut down the whole country. What were they protesting about? Well, they thought that the constitutional monarchy of King Bhumipal was being undermined. So why yellow? Because King Bhumipal was born on a Monday. And in Thailand, every day has a color. And Monday is yellow. Tuesday is pink, Wednesday green, Wednesday night light green, Thursday orange, Friday blue, Saturday purple, and Sunday red. So obviously we know Taksan Shinawati was born on a Sunday. And to be a good Thai person, you should have at least seven outfits, or eight if you're planning to go out on Wednesday night, um, and you should have the color of the day. Now, if you don't have seven or eight different outfits, you should at least have a ribbon or a handkerchief or a flower or a sash or something to show that you're aware of the day it is. Um, and clothes are kind of important. Um, some of the clothes that we wear, um, weddings. Weddings in the West, the, the bride usually wears white, which is supposed to signify purity and innocence and virginity, which is false advertising if ever I heard it. <laughs> um, in the Middle Ages, people wore green because it was a new beginning. And in uh, Asia, um, in India, in Japan, in China, you wear red for the wedding. Couldn't wear red um, in the West because that indicates uh, that you're a fallen woman or seductress or something like that. Um, death, on the other hand, um, in the West we use black and the widow wears black, um, sometimes veers. In China it's white for death and uh, the widow wears white. In Mexico, uh, you have guinda, the special purple. Um, and I don't know if this is in other um, Spanish-speaking areas, but certainly in Mexico, you would use guinda, the purple, for death. And with colors, too, would you give white chrysanthemums to anybody in Japan? No way, because they indicate death. Would you give white lilies to anybody in Europe? I think not. That again is death. So flowers have meanings and the colors of flowers have meanings. And there was 
in Victorian England a practice called floriography. Now you couldn't just um, go and talk to whoever you admired, but you sent secret messages, either by the flowers you sent them, or you painted little cards, and the flowers on the cards gave a message. Um, again, hundreds of things could be associated with this. Um, yes, Simon wanted these to bounce. Um, so here were some of the messages, just doing it with um, hyacinths. Blue hyacinths meant constancy. Purple ones, I'm sorry, forgive me. Um, white, loveliness, I'll pray for you. Yellow, jealousy. Pink, red, play. And also with the roses. Come on, roses. There we go. Um, each of the coloured rose, rose has its own meaning. And um, you can actually use other flowers, but what you find, it's the colour that has the meaning. So um, you could have almost any flower, but yellow, if it's yellow, it um, means jealousy. Um, a lot of white flowers mean quiet, quietness, silence, death, which is kind of a major silence when you think about it. Um, okay, going on from that. Who owns colours? Now, you may think that colours belong to everybody, but if you go and talk to a patent attorney, he will tell you something quite different. Now, in Australia, we have a little company called Daryl Lee. And in 1888, Daryl Lee started making chocolates. And they wrapped them in purple wrappers. And 100 years later, along came Cadbury Fry Schweppes and said, no, you can't use that purple. It's ours. And there have been huge wars about who owns the purple. Similarly, um, uh, BP had a big... Monica, are you here? Where's Monica? No, Monica's not here. Um, Monica's here, yes. Okay, I think, Monica, it was... Um, the BP had the big argument with Reynolds because it was the same green. The, the gas stations, the service stations, had the same colour. And BP went to court um, and said to Reynolds, you cannot use that green, it's our green. Um, or not Reynolds, Sinclair. Sinclair. Um, big argument with um, EasyJet. Now, EasyJet, the, the jets are orange, and they've started all these other companies, there's Easy this and Easy that and Easy the other thing, and they're all orange. And they thought, oh, we'll have a mobile phone company. So it was Easy Orange. But there was a French company, the Orange Phones, and they got extremely upset. So another litigation about that. I think in Germany, uh, the magenta, um, there's a particular magenta, yeah, and that's, there's a big argument about that, who owns that, uh, that's another political thing, oh, sorry, legal thing that's gone on. Um, other ones, um, there's, Heinz believes that they own the, the colour turquoise for their beans. There are college, um, Josie's in the United States. Now, you cannot sell a T-shirt of the same colour, even if it has no writing on it. Uh, there is um, a judgment from the Fifth Court of Appeal, whatever, whatever, about that, which I could read out to you. Uh, so they own those colours, because there is a likelihood that you might um, associate the colour with a particular thing. Um, Toblerone... Um, this is not a colour thing, but they have uh, the patent on the triangle. Nobody else can have triangular chocolates or triangular anythings. That's Toblerone's. And um, there is a cigar company um, whose name I forget, I'd have to look it up. Uh, and they have patented the first six bars of Bach's Air and a G-string. They are the only people who can have that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, haven't talked about rainbows, haven't talked about an awful lot of things, but there's also next year. Um, thank you for your patience. Thank you.